everybody, Charles for HumbleMechanic.com. Today I'm going to be taking your questions on braking in engines, fuel economy, this thing with Volkswagen and the EPA, and more. This is episode 96 of the Humble Mechanic Podcast. So if you want a question answered on a show like this, email me, Charles, at humblemechanic.com and put question for Charles in the subject. But before we dive into your questions, let's talk about the sponsor of the day, which is CRP Automotive. CRP deals in a ton of OE maintenance and repair parts, everything from timing belts to suspension components and even fluids. They actually supply Volkswagen and Audi with the factory DSG fluid. So check them out at crpautomotive.com. All right, I got this question from a ton, a ton, a ton of you guys on Friday. My entire Facebook news feed was filled with the uh, the EPA fine to Volkswagen for you know lying about emissions controls or whatever. And a lot of you guys have asked me on what my take is, being that I work at a dealership. Well, here's the thing: being that I work at a dealership, I have no idea. We're generally like the bottom tier of people that know what the heck's going on when stuff like this happens. You've seen this come through in a bunch of news media outlets, and I really don't have any more information than that. I know my buddy Wayne from cleanmpg.com has done a lot of research and digging into this situation. He wrote an article about what's going on that I'll be sure to put a link to in the show notes so you guys can check it out. But my take is, I have no idea. I really don't know what's going on, what's gonna happen, how Volkswagen's gonna resolve this. I'm pretty upset with Volkswagen for not letting the dealerships know anything about this. Basically, we just got blindsided with a ton of phone calls. Hey, what's going on with my car? How are you gonna fix my car? Is my car gonna explode? Crazy stuff, but people don't know. They hear these stories and they read these articles and a lot of this stuff becomes sensationalized in the media so that basically you'll click the link and read their article and people get scared when they read anything's wrong with their car, even if it may just be something as simple as a software update or a coding change. But I really don't know. And until I have all the information, I'm not going to speculate on what's going to happen, what has happened, whether or not this $18 billion fine is going to happen with Volkswagen or not. We really all just don't know exactly what's going to go down. So thanks for sending that to me. A bunch of you guys sent it to me. And uh, we're just going to have to wait and see, see what happens. But I wanted to get that out of the way first and tell you guys also, don't worry about it. If it's a software update, Volkswagen will let you know. If it's something else, Volkswagen will let you know. Whatever ends up happening, you will be notified. I will say though, this is a really good opportunity to point out, make sure your car is registered with the manufacturer. That way, if there are updates and recalls, you get notifications on it. I know not everybody brings their car to the dealership for service and that's okay, but you wanna make sure if there's something going on and something you need to get fixed, you get an email or you get a notification, or you can take the VIN of your car and run it through the government's website that'll check for open recalls. Which, as I have found out on my GTI, is not 100% accurate. The government website said that my GTI had an update for like a sticker for the tire pressure monitor. Nothing showed open on Volkswagen's end, so the uh, the dealership's actually having to get that worked out before I can even register the car. So as far as the CPA thing, sit tight. As soon as I know something, I'll be sure to let you guys know. All right, with that, let's get into your questions. First one comes from Peter. I just purchased a 2015 TDI sport wagon and wanted to know the proper way to break in the engine. Love your very informative podcast. Keep up the great work. Um, Peter, a lot of different things come into play uh, in the breaking in an engine on a new car. I think a lot of owner's manuals tell you to take it easy for about the first 500 to 1,000 miles keeping it out of the really high RPM range so that everything can kind of set in properly. But I will tell you, having seen a lot of vehicles driven on the lot, off the truck, on test drives, uh, that engine has been ran at high RPM. So, you know, would I want to take it to the drag strip and run it or take it to VIR and, and do laps in a street course? Absolutely not. Not until it had, you know, a few thousand miles on it. But as far as getting up in the higher RPM, it's probably gonna be okay. I really wouldn't give this a whole ton of concern. Again, based on the way I've seen some of these cars driven when they were new. So again, I wouldn't worry a whole lot about it, but if you wanna take it easy for the first 500 to 1500 miles, I don't think that's gonna be a problem. That's probably what I would do. I was pretty easy on the Tiguan for a little while. Now that she's got about 3000 miles on it, I'm a little heavier in the throttle. But the other side of that is, you drive a TDI, we probably wanna try and keep our fuel economy high. 
and being heavy in the throttle is kind of the antithesis of getting good fuel mileage. Okay, next one comes from Taylor. Do I have any recommendations for things to look out for when you think your gas mileage is lower than it should be? Taylor, awesome job on sending me this email, man. Ask a question right away and then a description right below it. That's perfect. That really does help me answer these questions a lot better. So awesome job, man. I actually got a bunch of questions on reduced fuel economy. So this is gonna to apply to the rest of you guys as well that have sent me questions about your fuel economy being lower than you really think it should be. Okay, so Taylor has a Mark 6 Golf R that is getting around 14 miles to the gallon city and highway. The car is modified, however, when driving conservatively, the gas mileage is still not ideal. The car has 55K on it, and I have a hunch that carbon buildup is not helping in my favor. However, because the car isn't throwing any codes, it's hard to tell. Vlog my short-term fuel trims at idle and everything looks fine, so I haven't done a pull to see how it is while driving. Um, Taylor, first thing, whenever you're concerned about fuel economy, we need to go through and look at maintenance. We need to start with, you know, as simple as oil change, tire rotation. Tires are a big, big, big thing. Now, I don't think tires are going to cut your fuel economy in half before you get to the point where your car drives really bad, but you want to keep an eye on your tire pressure. We want to look at spark plugs, fuel filter, top to bottom, all the maintenance components and make sure that everything is perfect. We also need to look at what fuel we're using. Are we switching fuel stations and, you know, at a BP, we're getting really crappy fuel economy, but at a Shell station, we're getting really great fuel economy. That's something we want to pay close, close, close attention to. It may just be the fuel station that you always get fuel at seems to have a problem with bad fuel in the tanks. We also have to consider that your car is modified, so the fuel economy may not be what it would be if the vehicle was stock. Now, 14 miles of the gallon seems pretty low to me, but then I'm also thinking of how I would drive a Golf R, and that's probably the fuel economy that I would get, because I'd be heavy in the throttle a lot. Also remember your car's all-wheel drive, which is going to reduce fuel economy as well compared to other 2.0-liter GTIs and Golfs. We also can look at things like the brakes. Maybe you have a brake that's dragging and slowing the vehicle down, making the engine work harder. Maybe it's something in the transmission. Maybe it's something in the drivetrain, beyond the transmission, in the rear diff or the prop shaft. So, you got a lot going on. There's a lot of things on the Golf R that can influence fuel economy. Start with maintenance, do a visual inspection, make sure your tire pressure is set, and kind of go from there. Most of the time when you're getting really reduced fuel economy, your engine computer will tell you, and based on the readings that you gave me, plus 1.6 and minus 5.5, um, you may have a slight, slight, slight boost leak, maybe, but I don't think that's enough to really drastically affect your fuel economy. But take a good look over your car and make sure that you don't have anything crazy going on. Again, make sure your maintenance is up to date. And you're right, carbon very well may be playing a role in what's going on. Not so much carbon buildup on the backs of the valves, but even carbon on the tips of the injectors can change the way fuel flows out of the injector and cause reduced fuel economy. So great question, Taylor, and everyone else that sent me a similar question. Taylor, if you figure out what was the thing causing your fuel economy issue, please post it so that we can all learn from it and then what you did to resolve it. Okay, next one comes from Daniel. I was wondering a few things about the Mark 7 GTIs. Have you seen any issues with performance packs, limited slip differential? I'm assuming that all covered under powertrain warranty also. Additionally, any issues with the lighting package's headlights? I'm assuming that's not covered under warranty and would be costly to replace a bulb or the whole unit if needed. Lastly, would you recommend the extended warranty? Daniel, um, nice job sneaking three questions in in one. Not very many issues with the Mark 7 GTIs as a whole. No issues with the limited slip as far as I have seen. Remember that is a low production number car. So if there are sporadic issues here and there, we would probably see them, but I haven't had anyone at all complain or have an issue with their limited slip or something that could even be attributed to a limited slip issue. And you're right, because that is internal of the transmission that should be covered under a powertrain warranty. There's always extenuating circumstance where that may not be the case, because we have to remember what a manufacturer's warranty is. It is to cover defects, not necessarily abuse. So let's say you sidestep the clutch, blow the differential out, that wouldn't be something that's covered. But a normal failure or a manufacturer defect, that would be covered under base warranty as well as powertrain. But if an issue comes up, it's really up to the dealership that your car is at to make the determination. As far as lighting packages go, not one issue at all with the GTIs. They've been great. I want to say that there was a software update maybe for the GLI, uh, but those were really rare as well. I don't think I've even done one of them. I just kind of remember seeing a technical service bulletin about it. 
Very, very, very few issues. Yeah, if you have a problem with it, it's gonna be super expensive. I'm assuming that you would have to replace the entire housing. If it's just a bulb, even the bulbs are expensive, but that's not a really common failure point. That stuff probably would be covered under the base warranty, but that's not something that would be covered under a powertrain warranty. And would I get the extended warranty? Um, the one you got listed here is six years, 90,000 miles. I don't know. Um, that's only one extra coverage of powertrain by year. I will say that I like the extended amount of time and mileage that things would be covered as a whole. When it comes to extended warranties, it really 100% depends on the warranty. If it covers everything and you got a $50 deductible, I would buy that in a second. If it only covers gaskets and you have a $200 deductible, I would be very, very leery of buying that warranty. So Daniel, what you need to do is you need to look at the coverage options on the warranty. And if you're gonna buy one, buy the one that covers the most things that you can possibly buy. I probably wouldn't buy an extended warranty that didn't cover electrical components on my car. So again, you need to look at the warranty as a whole look at what it covers, hopefully they list what is not covered, and that's probably gonna be a more inclusive policy than if they tell you the things that are covered. I can't really recommend buying it or not buying it without reading the whole policy, but I will tell you if you can find a warranty with a low deductible that covers almost everything, I would buy it. Okay, next question comes from Ben. I'm a sophomore in high school. I have always had a big interest in cars and I'm in my second year of the automotive program at my high school. Being a technician is definitely something that I'm interested in. I've been researching schools such as Universal Technical Institute, but wasn't sure if it would be a good idea to invest money in a school like that, or just to teach myself how to do the work. Obviously with technology and modern cars, it would be hard to teach myself a lot of the things about cars. So that is where a trade school would come in. The only problem is tuition. What path did you take to become a mechanic and overall, what would you say is the best course of action to become a technician for a big company such as VW, BMW, or Audi, or something of that nature? Um, ben, dude, awesome question, man. I went to UTI. I went to just the very basic automotive program, and then I did the manufacturer's program for Volkswagen. Now, they don't have the Volkswagen program anymore, but they actually do still have the BMW program as of right now. It's a very expensive school. Um, gosh, I think now guys are paying like 35 grand uh, for, for the automotive program and then you can add on electives like Ford and Nissan programs. So the, the dollar figure can really, really, really add up. Um, is it worth it? Maybe. It was to me, but I will tell you that I worked my ass off while I was there. I didn't just come in, lollygag around, and then go home and hope that I would, by osmosis, like absorb information. I actually worked really, really hard to make sure that I was getting the maximum amount of value out of that training. And if you're not willing to do that, don't go to one of those schools. I went to school with a lot of guys that completely squandered their opportunity to, uh, to learn at the school. I've also at the dealership seen a lot of new guys come in that didn't do the work and didn't learn what they needed to learn and are way behind where they really should be, even on their first day. So yes, it is a very expensive program, but for me, it worked out really, really well. I was able to take what I learned at UTI, bring it to the Volkswagen Academy, really excel in the Volkswagen Academy, and then land a job really before I was done with the Volkswagen Academy, picked up, moved my family, and I've been working at the same dealership ever since. So without that program, I don't know where I would have been. Now, there are other ways to become a technician. I actually did a show. I'll put a link in the show notes so you can check it out. There are other ways to get into a shop or get into a dealership. You can kind of get your foot in the door by starting as a service express. Even as a detail person, you can get your foot in the door and then begin to learn. It makes it easy when you have a base knowledge about cars, about working on cars. You know, you've been in the automotive program at your high school, which is a huge advantage, and I wish that more young people would really take advantage of those programs. I wish I would have taken advantage of those programs when I was in high school, because it would have been great to get the hell out of there <laughs> on a, like a half a day of, of school. I was terrible at high school, so that would have been like a blessing for me. But you don't need to spend $40,000 to get this training. You can get this training other places. There's a lot of information online. You have to be very careful with the information that you get online. Some of it's awesome, and there's guys like Jason from Engineering Explained and Eric the Car Guy and a bunch more that are super, super awesome. And I would trust most everything that they say, but then there's a lot of guys that don't know what the hell they're doing, and sometimes I watch their videos and just you know slap my forehead because it's, it's bad information. So be very careful with that kind of stuff. 
Um, getting into a shop is a really good way to go. You can join the military. Community colleges have automotive programs. You're in the high school one. I don't really know if you'd see the benefit from a community college program or not. There are alternatives to UTI. So explore those, explore WyoTech, see what that's about. Look at your location and see is there a school close and go visit and talk to them and see what kind of information they give you. Get a vibe for the place. Look at the students. See what the guys and girls that are about to graduate are like. Ask them whether they have a job or not. The thing I really like about UTI is the manufacturer's program. If I were gonna decide to go to UTI now, I would make sure that I got into one of those programs. With Volkswagen, not only did they pay for the Volkswagen training, but they paid for a bunch of my schooling. I got a tool voucher. I had like a guaranteed starting dollar figure. So there was a lot of benefit to joining one of those programs. I'm not sure what manufacturers they still have doing these programs at UTI, but if you're gonna go the UTI route, man, that is the way to go in my opinion. I'll also say the guys that took the Ford Fact and the Nissan program were much better at diagnostics than the guys that didn't. So there's a lot of value in these elective programs that they have at UTI. This is not a UTI commercial by any means. This is just based on my experience personally at UTI and what I've seen the guys knowing and not knowing coming out of the school. So. UTI was a good investment for me. It's not for everybody. It's a lot of hard work and you really have to put in the work to get your money out. So Ben man, good luck to you. I hope it works out. I hope you figure out the best route for you. And hey man, you're still in high school. Get yourself a part-time job, save up a thousand bucks, buy a beater car and start working on it because all the schooling in the world is not gonna give you the hands-on ability that you really need to do this job. Okay, next one comes from Gary. I have a 2008 Volkswagen Passat 2.0T that's dying on me shortly after I start it. If I let it sit for a few minutes, it will start up again only to fail after a few miles. The car has almost 80,000 miles on it. I was planning on changing the timing belt and water pump soon anyhow. Would the thermostat be the cause of my dying engine? AutoZone read the codes and said it could be something with the cooling system performance. Um, Gary, maybe, it may be, like hugely maybe be caused by the thermostat. I've seen engine coolant temperature sensors cause weird extended cranks, no starts, car shutting off, but I don't really think the thermostat will do it. On the 2008 Passat, it's a two liter turbo. Gosh, you know, I'm like my gut, my gut says that it's probably the fuel pump control module. That's just pulling, pulling a, a gas out of thin air, but um, you know, that would definitely allow you to start the vehicle after a few minutes of sitting once that module or even the pump in the tank cooled down. Uh, I would go the route of fuel pressure. You're really gonna wanna put a fuel pressure gauge on it to test that. You can also pull the back seat up and have someone try and crank the car and see if you hear the fuel pump coming on. That may be a quick diagnosis instead of having to find a fuel pressure gauge to, uh, to do this test, but gut says fuel man, I don't know. Uh, this is not a really common concern with, with the Passats. It doesn't sound like it's an immobilizer issue because that'll let the car start and then immediately, like after a second, shut it off. So I'm kind of feeling like fuel, but it really depends on how the car is dying. If you're starting it up, and I'm, I'm doing this because those Passats have a push button start. If you're starting it up, and it runs perfect and shuts off exactly like the way it would if you took the key out of the ignition, we're looking at an electrical concern. If it starts up and sputters and starts to die like it is running out of fuel, well, it may be running out of fuel. So pay attention really close on how the car is shutting off and kind of stage your diagnostic approach from there. If it's just immediately shutting off, what we probably wanna do is get all the faults in the car scanned, not just the engine faults. To do that, you're gonna to need to take it to a Volkswagen dealership, you're gonna to need to get VAGCOM, you need to find someone with VAGCOM, or find a Volkswagen Audi specialty place and bring it to them and let them scan all the modules in the car. Only pulling engine faults may not tell you the entire story, so we wanna do a full scan of the car and see what else is going on. If it's sputtering, then we wanna to look to the fuel system or even the ignition system and again, pull the back seat up, put your ear near the fuel pump and have someone try and start the car and see if you even hear the pump coming on. You can also look at the fuel pump control module and see if it has a melted spot in it. I did a video on how that fuel pump module fails. I'll put a link in the show notes so you can watch that to give you a little bit of understanding on how that fuel pump module works. So Gary, good luck to you, man. Great question. And when you find out what it was, be sure to post it for us in the comments section. All right, I got time for one more question. This one comes from Hansus. Could I make a video on repairing wires? I read soldering is a big no-no. Can you explain why? 
Why are you advised to use yellow wires for repairs? Does it help to spot previous places of repairs or is it some trademark that repair was done at a dealership? How often do you repair wires? I guess there are places where wire is more likely to get damaged, like looms that run into doors, maybe a DIY video on this kind of place. Um, awesome, like 700 questions, dude. Um, so yeah, I'll do a video on how to make wiring repairs the Volkswagen way, um, and I can make a video on how to solder wires. There's a ton of videos on how to solder wires out there. Um, I don't know if like my video is going to really be any better or any more information about soldering than some of the other ones are out there. I think Eric the car guy did a video on how to solder wires. I'll try and find a link to that and put that in the show notes for you guys. I will do a video though on how to make repairs the way Volkswagen tells us to because I want to install a radio in my Passat and uh, I'm going to use that opportunity to make a video on it. As far as the yellow wires, you hit it right on the head. We do that so that the next person can identify that a repair has been made. And yeah, it's a trigger to let people know that yes, this repair was done at a dealership or someone that has dealership experience. As far as why we don't solder wires, like that last question, my gut says that it's because a lot of people really don't know how to solder wires. Um, these, the connectors that we're supposed to use are double crimp as well as heat shrink, and they hold up incredibly well. I have seen wires break before those connections break, but just like soldering wires, the integrity of the repair depends on the quality of the repair. So if the wire's not crimped all the way or not heat shrunk all the way, you can develop potentials for problems. I really like the crimp connections everywhere in the vehicle. It makes it, to me, easier and faster to do that repair than to solder wires and worry about what's going on near that because you're using a lot of heat. I've also seen, for some reason, people smoke ECMs by soldering wires, especially on fuel injectors for whatever reason. So that's another area of concern of why we don't make solder repairs on Volkswagens. There are a lot of places, and you nailed it, the doors, that wires tend to fail more often than others. Think about it, every time you open the door, you're stretching and crimping, stretching and crimping a wire loom, and inside the wire loom is, you guessed it, wires. That's why, especially on the Mark V Jettas, we see so many wiring issues in the door boot. Sadly, repairing inside of there, it can work, but it rarely does. If you're doing a repair, you're putting a hard spot in that wire that's supposed to be flexible. So now what's gonna happen, and I've done it, so I've tried, right? I've tried and it's, it fails on one side or the other. You just, you have a hard spot and it's, it'll flex here and then it'll just break. So not the best idea to repair it inside the place where it moves. You can run a new wire like further downstream and that'll work pretty well. The problem is a lot of times that's gonna be more work and translate to a higher cost than just to put the whole harness in and be done with it with all new wires. So awesome question, man. Awesome, like I said, awesome five or six questions. And yeah, I'll work on the, uh, the wiring repair video as soon as I can get around to getting this radio ready to go so I can install in my Passat because I really want to have Bluetooth. So that's it. Awesome bunch of questions, guys. Thank you very much. Remember, if you want a question on a show like this, email me, charles at humblemechanic.com and put question for Charles in the subject. All right, I'm gonna wrap it up there. If you have any questions or comments, post it in the comment section below. Hey, if you liked the video, throw it a thumbs up on YouTube. I always appreciate that. You can also subscribe on YouTube or on the blog at humblemechanic.com. You can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, the blog, and obviously here on YouTube. All right, guys, thanks for watching, and I will see you next time. Beer of the day. Uh, I mentioned last week my folks were in town, and uh, they brought some beer for us. This is Daisy Cutter from Chicago. Uh, the brewery is awesome, downtown Chicago brewery. Very cool spot. I've been there a few times with some friends of mine, and uh, Daisy Cutter's incredible. So uh, if you see this beer, definitely, definitely pick one up.